So here we have another RRS project car, uh, quite rare XP Coupe, uh, it's very similar to US Falcon Sprint in all of its formats, a little bit different to a Caliente. However, this car came to us in a box of pieces. There was virtually nothing of it. Uh, roof wasn't on, rear quarters weren't on, cow panel wasn't on. A lot of those things had been repaired and successfully repaired for the most part. But the whole chassis was a disaster. And it was all specifically designed to be a drag racer by the builder which isn't what the brief given to him by the customer was. He wanted a road going car, a daily driver. So we'll take you through all of the changes that we made uh, to show how this car has come along to this point. So unfortunately that meant that we had to pull all the back half of the car back out, put a donor back half in and put mini tubs in it along with the floor and recreate the whole lot almost back to original but we've had to accommodate his massive big wheels um, the correct wheels really should be purchased before you start building a car so that you know all the dimensions of what you're doing and get the wheels right so unfortunately we had to build a car around a set of wrong wheels so we've accomplished that but it means that there's been a number of custom pieces of equipment that we've created to make that possible which we can only do in-house. Uh, there's so many variables with this, uh, the axle neck lengths, the uh, bearing diameters, the way the brakes clear, other things like the chassis rails and as we go through the installation of the RRS products I'll point out some of these things. So now we're about to do the final fit out all the bodywork has been completed on this car. Uh, it's got its engine bay painted, so now it's ready to have the motor and front end fitted. We're first of all going to install the three link rear end. So it's already been mocked into place as we repaired and aligned the chassis. Now it's ready to be fitted as a completed part, ready for road usage. Quite often, rust repairs are done, accident damage, Chassis rails move around when they're stripping out the old panels and then there's alignment issues. Most of the time we can sort these things out. On this one, everything is perfectly aligned. I'll just point out some of the things that we had to change on this vehicle uh, to get everything to fit. The floor from this point all the way back to the rear tail panel, including putting on the tail panel. Uh, the wheel arches, inner and outer, uh, the rear quarters, drop down panels, and transmission tunnel all the way through, and a donor firewall because the firewall had been taken out and a recessed firewall put in that didn't allow room for air conditioning, heated demister, the wipers to operate correctly, or even enough room for wiring. And there was no consideration of how the clutch hydraulic clutch would work. So all of that has been rectified already and uh, the customer is very happy with the progress so far. So now let's start installing the three link. So here we have a pre-assembled RRS rear end. This has actually been in the car uh, in its basics form so that we could actually drive it, debug it before we even put a coat of paint on the vehicle. Now there's a number of things that are different to our standard supplied rear end on this and the people who are used to RRS products may be able to pick them straight away. This is a particularly narrow axle housing. Now that presents all sorts of issues when you're designing the whole thing. So this had to have custom brakes, uh, custom axles that are exceptionally short. Other things that we've already set up and mounted, and you'll see this when it goes in the car, is we've mounted the hard lines in a different way than you would find in a standard vehicle for the brake lines. So we have a strange axle housing, which is reinforced and baffled, strange centre section, 
so this makes it bulletproof, Daytona pinion snout and a 1350 yoke so we take the big size uni. It's also fitted with super super strong Mark Williams axles. This is fitted with uh, a true track center and 3.5 rear gears because it has a 5 speed overdrive manual transmission. Other things are our front cross member has been modified. Now we supply this cross member with the RRS3 link but as an option we also can supply this tongue that can be welded to the cross member that then becomes a gearbox mount and this will suit multiple different types of gearbox applications so 6R80, uh, 10R80, uh, 5, 6 speed manual transmissions, uh, the AOD from the US uh, also the Australian BTR so there's and of course our uh, ZF gearbox so all of these components are custom but we also can supply them so we'll show you how all this fits up now so that's the front cross member at the back we have the upper shop mount frame now you'll see that this has a plate here, a joining piece and the reason for that is this adds additional support into the back floor that originally was never designed to carry its load there but when you have freely articulating shock absorbers and the load is spread over a larger area and then reinforced it becomes a substantial cross member to be able to mount all of our rear coilover shocks and support the weight adequately with a large amount of durability and adding stiffness to the vehicle. Added to that, we have a Watts linkage. Alright, so this Watts linkage frame has already been mounted in the vehicle uh, and set up. We can adjust the roll centre, which we've already done, and that way we can get a nice balanced car in its cornering capacity. No excessive understeer, no excessive oversteer, nice and neutral, that's the way I like it. Um, added to that we also have our height adjustments because of this particular application we've gone very very low because of the massive big rear wheels otherwise it would look like a four wheel drive and we don't want that. So let's bolt it all in. So prior to fitting this rear shock absorber mount, we remove the factory snubber. There's a steel bracket that's normally welded to the floor on uh, US Falcon Sprints and Australian Early Falcons. And that has to have the spot welds drilled off, made sure it's nice and flat so that this bolts up in place. These are the bolts that do the main part of the anchoring of the rear frame. This is captured by the shock absorber mount so that the load is spread in a much larger area. There's a big heavy duty washer to clamp it in place. This washer more than triples the surface area that the load is spread over. And that's a vitally important part. Uh, in the past, when people have fitted air shocks they've been notorious for cracking the floor and part of the reason for that is the surface area that the rubber goes to is very small added to that that rubber is actually articulating so over a very small area it's trying to go side to side backwards and forwards in a small surface area and that's why they used to crack out when you fix this in place with a really large washer and a much larger surface area and the shock absorber no longer has an articulating load on it because it has a johnny joint in the end of the shock absorber the load is considerably decreased the whole thing becomes a reinforced structure normally the load bearing of the weight of the vehicle is through the chassis rails at this point and at the end of the uh, shackle mount. 
So now it's been relocated to here. So it has to spread its load into the chassis rails. So this pressing is more than adequate. This part in this area is not adequate enough. That's why it needs this reinforcement, this reinforcement, and the load spread is fitted to the inside. But once you get to this point where everything's bolted up, you can hang the shock absorbers ready to mount the disc. So here is the Johnny joint that allows free articulation. This decreases the load put on the mounting location, so it's not twisting it. Very, very important to allow enough compliance in all of the components so there's no bind in anything. Here we have our Watts linkage frame. The most important thing to understand about a Watts linkage is it only has lateral load. So it's only got forces going side to side, not backwards and forwards. The load that is generated onto this is transferred into the chassis, stabilizing the axle housing. It's transferred through this point through the arms directly into the chassis rails. That way it gives it additional support and this frame itself also tightens the chassis because it ties the two frame rails together to act as one. Now there's a substantial difference between a US model uh, 65, 66 coupe or, or, or earlier. This frame rail is not in the US models. This is an Australian thing. Now, also there are some other minor shape changes in the floor. We fitted US Falcon floors to early Australian cars and there's a seat frame runner that actually comes right across. So in the US models, the way it bolts up into the floor is to straddle this part of the floor instead of coming up through here. Now there is one sort of negative in that, um, in the Australian one, because it comes up into a frame rail, we are able to put crush tubes which also add additional support. I like it so it can take at least a thousand horsepower, at least. Okay, so next we're going to fit the actual rear axle assembly, so trailing arms and torque arm. So we're going to attach the front uh, over centre link, that way we can just swing it up into place. Now in these early Falcons, there are two different sizes of shank on the front spring eye bolt, and you use the factory one. 61, 62, it most probably has the small shank. Therefore, it will require this sleeve being fitted into the front eyelet cushion. If it has the later model, a utility station wagon panel van, it will have the larger diameter shank and it will not require a bushing. This bolt goes straight into this. It won't require the sleeve. So we've just set up the shims in the lower shock absorber mount. The reason that we have different size shims is so that you can make sure in full droop that the angle of the shock absorber at the bottom is the same as the top. As the diff travels through its range of motion, this will start to stand up straight. So it's fully lowered point is its most articulated point. At ride height, it should be virtu virtually straight. 
and then as it goes through that to full bump, it'll articulate a little bit the other way. So all these clearances are minimal to protect everything. Alright, now the trick with the arms. Most important thing before you put the arms in is to make sure the surface is clean, free from paint because it'll gall up on the bushes, and make sure it has stacks of lube on it. positioning the over center link so that the pinion angle is optimized and that the link is vertical when it's in its resting position. The link needs to be vertical when it's set at its ride height. At the moment the suspension is in full droop. We've got to set it at the ride height that it's got to be so that this is vertical at ride height not full droop. Likewise I'm going to adjust the roll centre so that when it's at ride height, this is approximately one inch, 25 mil, below the centre line of the axle. This, with this engine combination, produces a nice neutral steering car. is to make sure the diff is centralised in the chassis so that the guard caps are even, both left and right. Okay, so this is one of our variations of a three-link rear end that we've installed here. We have them with an axle housing, we can do them with a customer's axle housing, we can provide them so that the customer can do his own axle housing with weld-on plates, or alternatively, we have a spring adapter that bolts with U-bolts to the housing. And it's all according to uh, the customer's budget. So the other part of this that's really important to mention is the modular design of this allows you to just do this to the vehicle and have a transformation. Doesn't require the front end. However, it's best to do the whole lot. Uh, also, with the braking systems, there's a number of variations to suit and to balance the car. We've right up to the stage now where the basic install is done, and the next stage is fine tuning prior to road service and then tweaking it to the next level once we get it out on the road and see what all the settings are doing. Finished. Yeah.